morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the SS 656 Design, Development, and Validation of MIRNA Based Diagnostics Webinar Launch. So before we start, please note that there will be a pop-up screen on your right where you can input your questions for our Q&A session later. So for our opening address, uh, we would like to welcome uh, Biomedical and Health Centers Committee Chairman Dr. Yong Chen Chet, a medical doctor by training and having held senior roles in management consulting, healthcare management, technology innovation, and business tra transformation endeavors. He is currently a founding member, Chief Operating Officer of Good Doctor Technology Singapore, and an early stage regional digital healthcare startup backed by Ping An Good Doctor, Grab and SoftBank Vision Fund. Dr. Yong, please. For the introduction. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to the webinar launch of Singapore Standard uh, 656 Design, Development, and Validation of MicroRNA Based Diagnostics. Now, this standard provides guidance for the evaluation studies of assays based on its defined intended purpose, including commercial in vitro diagnostic assays, as well also for assays developed uh, for clinical laboratory uh, for diagnostic purposes. Hence, it is not difficult to imagine that the landmark foundational work related to SS656 will have profound significant impact on downstream applications that directly uh, touch the lives of people. As with any endeavor, there is a starting point to the journey. Genesis and call to the drafting of SS656 was a result of a collaboration between Stand Up Singapore organizations, notably ASTAR, DXD Hub, Nexus, and the Health Science Authority, HSA. In coming up with a reference and guideline for microRNA diagnostics, which practically uh, could be used by HSA for the regulatory work and involves the registration of diagnostic assays that utilize the fundamental uh, technology of microRNA. Subsequently, the working group was formed with the additional participation of National University of Singapore, NUS, Singapore Polytechnic, and as well at Tan Tok Ping Hospital. Now, work on drafting the standard officially kicked off in November 2019, and it took a record of only three and a half months to complete. Now, that is not the only uh, accolade of this uh, standard work. During the process, this standard has gathered international attention and the recognition of key industry leaders of whom we are humbled and grateful for their involvement. They are Professor Frank Slack of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Harvard Medical School, Dr. Fong Yu Lian of Jensen, Johnson and Johnson, and Dr. Kenneth Cole of the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, whom have joined as resource members of the drafting team. Now, such was the level of collaboration and talent that came together for SS656. Globally renowned talent who are also absolute experts in the field. It will be hard for us to suppress this level of mastery uh, for some time ahead of again. Now, as if the accolades shared were not impressive enough, the standard has also been proposed and discussed at the ISO level with the Secretariat and Convenience of ISO TC 212 Working Group 4, concurring to utilize SS656 as the basis of their own ISO standards. So before I uh, hand over the stage to our next speaker, uh, allow me once again to congratulate the effort and achievement of the working group members of standard uh, Singapore Standard 6x6 for the significant and amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Yong. So uh, we would like our participants to help to answer a short survey after each of our presenters uh, later. So next up, we have Mr. Kevin Tan, who is the Secretary for the BHSC, to give us a short introduction on the Singapore Standardization Program. Mr. Kevin Tan, please. Hi, uh, thank you, Long Hoi. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll be your appetizer. 
uh, before the main course of the, I guess, the Wemidan launch. So I'll be presenting on the Singapore standardization program. Okay, so there's basically um, three short sections. This is the outline. So the first section will be on the overview of the standardization program. So uh, Enterprise Singapore is the national standards body for Singapore. So what they do is they administer the Singapore standardization program, formulate uh, policies, strategies, programs, and procedures for the program. Uh, they also publish the Singapore standards as well as technical references. And they represent Singapore in the international and regional fora. So uh, the Singapore Standards Council, which is appointed by ESG, is an industry-led committee. They approve the establishment and withdrawal of standards. They also advise uh, Enterprise Singapore in implementing the policy strategies and programs for the Singapore Standardization Program. So uh, we have three coordinating committees which advises on the Singapore Standards Council, namely the Smart Nation, Civil, uh, Civil Industry, as well as Promotion. And there's also a new uh, committee for cybersecurity as well. So the Singapore Standards Council looks after 10 different committees as of now. And each of these standards committees, they have technical committees under them who then also have working groups. So uh, at each level of the committees, we try to engage the different stakeholders to actually get a more holistic uh, voice and view from the industry itself. So in each of these committees, we try to have different stakeholders such as industry associations, consumers, government uh, and professional bodies, and also institutes of higher learning. So there are two types of national standards. One is the Singapore standard, which is a nationally recognized document. Uh, it should be reviewed at the end of the stability period of not more than eight years. The next one we have is the technical reference, which is sort of a pre-Singapore standard uh, developed at meeting the urgent industry needs. Uh, these technical references are implemented for three years or less before a review, after which during the review, uh, the results can be for a continuation of the trial, uh, elevation of the technical reference to a Singapore standard, or a withdrawal of the technical reference. So uh, there are different types of standards, namely codes of practice, guides, methods of test, specifications, as well as vocabulary and terminology. So uh, we'll move on to the development process. So uh, how standards are usually developed is that a new item proposal has to be put up to Enterprise Singapore as well as the standards committees for assessment. Once it is uh, deemed significant, we will make an announcement for commencement of work and also to invite our stakeholders and participants to join us in the standardization process and drafting. We will then initiate the development of the standard after which you can take two routes. One is the technical reference, and one is the Singapore standard. The main difference is that uh, the technical reference do not go through a two-month public consultation. So just a short uh, intro on the timeline. So usually the technical reference takes about six to 12 months to develop, but the uh, Singapore standard usually takes about one to two years. So uh, international participation. So uh, Enterprise Singapore is the national standards body. What they do internationally is to facilitate the process of negotiation and also consensus building, and also to facilitate co close cooperation and synergy between the international standardization. So uh, how we do that is that we have national mirror committees to mirror what is being done at the international site, uh, for example, ISO and IEC. Uh, and also our national mirror committees are supposed to represent Singapore, the Singapore industry, and give a consensus voice to represent Singapore in internationally. So how do we participate internationally? Uh, we start off with the same form. Uh, we will then be uh, put up to Enterprise Singapore as well as the Standards Committee. Uh, if it's deemed significant, we will consult the relevant stakeholders. We will then form the committee and then participate internationally. So just a short intro on uh, the Biomedical Health Standards Committee, which uh, this Standard 656 is under. So our objective is to identify, develop, promote critical standards to support the biomedical and healthcare clusters to enable the development of Singapore into a world-class biomedical science hub. So our scope, we oversee the uh, development of biomedical healthcare standards relevant for application by local industry with a focus on quality systems, processes, medical devices, laboratory testing, biotechnology, therapeutics, complementary health products, and also health informatics. 
So uh, just some highlights on some of the key standards that we have published, which is uh, 644, which is on the um, delivery of medication. The next one is 656, uh, which we are here today for, actually. And the other one is SS582, Specification for Thermal Images for Human Screening. So I think during the current situation, uh, a lot of people, we see thermal images being deployed in malls and stuff. And uh, this standard is to advise on the specification of thermal images used and also the deployment of such thermal images. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kevin Tan. So Dr. John Tombeck will be giving us the presentation on the overview of SS656. So Dr. John Tombeck is the Chief Operating Officer of the Diagnostic Development Hub Singapore, and he has over 30 years of experience in diagnostic industry. So he was initially the head of R&D and then sales and marketing. And he's the CEO of various startups and spin-offs in Canada, UK and Singapore. So Dr. John Tombeck, please. Thank you, Young Hai. Okay. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Okay, well, microRNA-based um, diagnostic um, development has been a major focus for the Diagnostic Development Hub since we started. But Patrick and I, um, who were on the committee um, develop, to help develop this standard, um, are only the, the front of a, a team of people um, in, within Di Diagnostics Development Hub who have been involved in the development of this um, standard. In particular, Dominic, um, Anisha, and Janice, who were involved in the disc biomarker discovery, and um, Felicia and Zhaoyun in the um, verification and validation steps as well. And Jessica from our regulatory group also helped um, with the um, administration of the committee putting forward for the, developing this standard. So they're the people who actually did the work. Um, I'm just the front person. Okay, so why do we need a standard now and what is actually in the standard? That's the message. So why RNA? Well, microRNA. Well, it's a master regulator. It's been found over the last, um, what, 20 years almost now since it was discovered in humans. We're getting a, a growing um, knowledge of what it's, it's implicated in. There is, um, it gives a, it's been shown to be a master regulator of endogenous gene expression. There's growing cl clinical evidence that it can be used in, um, that it's implicated in lots of different disease states. And importantly, it has exceptional stability because it's incorporated generally inside vesicles. So it, allow, they, it has all the, the very good characteristics of a good biomarker. And we're also seeing now that industry is beginning to take up microRNA. Rex is who you'll hear from soon. Lee Han is giving the next talk, I believe. Um, we'll tell you a lot more about what Rexus has done. But there are a number of companies now who are involved in, who've taken the concept of microRNA and developed um, diagnostics related products. So basically this is, um, I guess, um, Gene Expression 101 for those of you who, um, who've forgotten your basic biology. Um, you have DNA, um, then basically the, you, you get a single stranded, single strand of that DNA is transcribed into a messenger RNA. Um, that messenger RNA then uh, moves from the nucleus into the cytoplasm in, and is then, then taken up by ribosomes who look at the codons and then form amino acid chains and then form the proteins. That's very simply what happens. So where does, so what, where does microRNA come into this? Well, microRNA comes into this because basically it regulates it. There is a microRNA gene that sits in the DNA, and what it does is messenger, the, the, that it interacts, the microRNAs react with the messenger RNA to block either the translation of the message or it degrades the messenger. So it has two main functions. What's interesting is that um, in, um, in some cases, the um, excretion that the, the, the um, microRNA can be excreted into biofluids. For instance, in tumor cells, tumor cells naturally excrete um, vesicle, um, vesicles which include microRNA, and then they are transported to other sites where they, where they um, block other messenger RNA. So um, there's a lot of potential um, 
involve, uh, diagnostics involved in that. But it also, it can happen that um, if there is damage to tissue, such as in cardiac situations, then the microRNA is released in damaged tissue. So there are multiple possible um, applications. As I said, it, multi it, it therefore microRNA regulates a, lo a lot of different um, physiological processes. Cancer is the one that um, we hear a lot more about, but it's also um, involved in cell proliferation, where it, uh, cell differentiation, where it um, degrades the target micro, uh, messenger RNA, and also um, in inhibition of translation, things like apoptosis and things like that. So because of that, microRNA dysregulation is associated with numerous different pathological states, which means that actually you could, there, there's a multiple, there is a possibility of developing microRNA-based diagnostics for many different potential indications. In non-cancerous area, it's been implicated in everything from acute myocardial infarction to rheumatoid arthritis. In cancers, it's been shown that um, it's implicated in lots of different cancers. Um, the first one um, you'll hear about today, I think, is going to be in, in gastric cancer. And so, the, and what we're looking at is the circulating microRNA profiles. Okay, so to summarize, it's an active re regulator and reflects numerous processes. It's a minimally invasive test because you're taking it from a biofluid, typically serum or plasma. And um, it's also to do it, also measurable using um, existing platforms, although we have had a, um, new technologies developed. So it can be used, uh, microRNA based diagnostics potentially could be used as diagnostic, prognostic, or predictive biomarkers. So there's a potentially wide, very wide application for these products. So, but so what, are the, what, what are the challenges then? MicroRNA are very small pieces of RNA, 18 to 22 um, nucleotides. And, that and the, the RNA, the, the microRNAs differentiate sometimes by only one nucleotide. So, and also because, as I said, they're buried inside biomolecules. So that creates a lot of problems. And it's really been the development of new technologies, either the stem loop technology, which is illustrated here, or things like LNA, which have allowed us to be able to amplify the, single str the initial strand um, process, the, the initial strand RNA to give um, amplification to then develop the diagnostics. As it says there, finding a needle in a haystack. So what is included in the, in the standard? Basically, it's a roadmap. And it takes you through the different stages of the, of the process. The first stage is, of course, biomarker discovery. And in this, what you're looking at is, trying to, is to try to develop, um, to, com to compare the um, expression of the um, different microRNA, of which are about 600, and they're all in a database between normal and patient populations, a patient population. So having done that, you try, we screen the 600. Um, you can do that by a number of different processes. You can do it by uh, microarrays, or you can do it individually. You can screen each, each um, microarray individually. And you bring that down to a much smaller number. And then when you're doing the validation, you, you will then take different patient populations, different patient samples, depending on what population you want, whether that's a global population or it may be a population within a um, certain, uh, say, Southeast Asian population, or it may be for a different, um, just a very small um, group of patients in certain diseases. And bring that down to between 12, 4, 24, or 32 and, it's, and if you take forward, say, 12 microRNAs, which are the ones that you find to have the, the biggest differentiation, then you go into the standard um, validation verification process that is carried out with um, normal PCR tests. And then final stage, you do a clinical validation. And then that will be a completely new set of, of samples. And that creates the documentation that will give you the clinical utility, which will give you the, the final product. So what does the scope include? It consists of design development, performance evaluation of the molecular diagnostic assays, 
It gives you guidance for the development process, and it's applicable to all microRNA-based diagnostic assays. So it's either a commercial I IVD or assays that have been developed and used in clinical laboratories, i.e. LDTs, by another word. So thank you very much. I hope that's given you a brief introduction to what microRNA is and um, what the, what's in the scope of this standard. And we hope that you will find it very useful. Thank you, Dr. John Tombeck. So for our next presentation on the application of SF656 from research to commercialization, we have three speakers. So the first speaker is Professor Frank Slack, who is the director of the Harvard Medical School Initiative for RNA Medicine, hosted at Beth Israel Dickens Medical Center. He is also the Shields Warren Mallicroft Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. Frank Cole discovered the first known human microRNA in Gary's Rufkin Laboratory at Harvard Medical School in the year 2000, and Dr. Slack subsequently moved to Yale University Cancer Center, where he discovered that microRNAs regulate key human oncogenes and have the potential to act as therapeutics. He also demonstrated the first draw of microRNA in the aging process. He is the co-founder of two companies in this area, MiraDX and 287RX and is or has been on the SAB of multiple additional companies, including Miraxis. And for the second speaker is Dr. Fong Liuyan, Jensen's Johnson & Johnson. So Dr. Fong is the Global Head of Diagnostic Strategy and Development of the Jensen's Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. Liuyan is develops and executes comprehensive strategies for effective integration of data sciences and diagnostics with therapeutics to enable early detection of diseases and help drive early therapeutic intervention and improve patient outcomes. Prior to Johnson & Johnson, Durian was the Vice President of R&D at Abbott Molecular and Executive Director of Companion Diagnostics at Novartis. Durian received her PhD in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. So for our last speaker is Dr. Zhou Li Han, who co-founded and served as the CEO of Miraxis Private Limited, a Singapore headquartered biotechnology company with the mission to develop accurate, affordable and actionable molecular diagnostics tests for disease early detection and precision medicine. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Miraxis contributed its R&D and manufacturing capabilities in Singapore to support the national effort in ramping up of COVID-19 testing. The 42 RT-PCR tests developed by ASTAR, Dantoxin Hospital and manufactured by Miraxis was the first approved test in Singapore and has become one of the most widely used tests globally, deployed in more than 45 countries. Lihan has a PhD in biochemistry from the NUS School of Medicine where he received training uh, in molecular neurobiology and nuclear acid detection technologies. In 2015, Li Han was recognized by the MIT Technology Review as a member of the Innovators Under 35. So we welcome our first speaker, Professor Frank Stack, please. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody in Asia and uh, good evening to all of you in the Americas. It's great uh, to be here. In the next few slides, I'm just going to give you a sense of how far we've come from the basic microRNA research that started a little over 20 years ago uh, to now uh, being in the commercialization stage of this exciting area of science. So as was mentioned, I, I have a few disclosures. I'm a founder of certain companies and I'm also on the scientific advisory board for Merixus. And um, so um, uh, it's, it's great for me to be here. If you could go to the next slide, please. Do I, do I work the slides? Can somebody go to the next slide? Uh, there we go. Uh, can you go back one? And back again? Okay, uh, forward one. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So uh, as uh, John was just saying, RNA is, of course, a central player in biology, but it's only res relatively recently over the last 20 years or so that we've fully appreciated just how extensive RNA 
uh, uh, reach is in our cells. We all know about the 20,000 or so protein coding messenger RNAs that our, that our cells uh, have the potential to encode. But what was not apparent even 20 years ago was that we have almost 10 times as many non-coding RNAs that are made from our cells. And these non-coding RNAs play regulatory functions. So of course they don't code for proteins. Um, uh, and, and one of the, the most famous examples of these non-coding RNAs are the microRNAs. MicroRNAs, as John mentioned, have the ability to, to base pair with other RNAs like, like messenger RNAs and regulate their expression. Um, so microRNAs um, were discovered only about uh, 20 years ago. And as I'll show you in the next few slides, um, we've come a, a very long way from discovering a completely new class of regulatory molecules in human cells to, to now finding their utility in clinical trials and um, as potential therapeutics as well. So next slide, please. So while microRNAs are small RNAs, John mentioned they're only in the, in the 20 to 22 nucleotides uh, size range, they're, they're extremely powerful. So they play roles in almost every part of our development, our homeostasis, uh, our aging, and of course, in many disease states. Um, microRNAs are not only found in animals, but also found in plants. And so there are now um, agricultural applications that are also emerging in, um, in plant biology. So one of the things that we'll talk about mostly today is, is on the bottom right there, the early detection saves lives part. So microRNAs, as John mentioned, are extremely stable within bodily fluids, including serum, uh, blood, tears, urine, etc and um, are increasingly being used in diagnostic applications. So next slide, please. John also mentioned this slide, but I'm gonna just go into a little bit more detail. Uh, John mentioned that microRNAs play multiple roles in um, cancer development. Um, in, in, in almost all of the stages, all of the hallmarks of cancer, we can find particular microRNAs. Uh, so the one microRNA that, that we discovered many years ago is LET7. You can see it there on the sort of at about four o'clock on the on the uh, wheel there. But another microRNA that, that we worked on quite extensively is MIR34 at about five o'clock. Um, and we and others have shown, for example, just as, as, as an example, that MIR34 regulates the expression of PDL1, which is of course one of the immune checkpoint uh, genes that, that 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 is targeted in immune checkpoint therapy. Um, uh, so another thing that John mentioned was that these microRNAs, while they have functions within cells, they also get packaged into exosomes. So on the right, we're showing these little microvesicles and exosomes that can package a variety of different RNAs, including microRNAs. And these uh, microRNAs can travel through the bloodstream to, to, to actually affect uh, the activity of, of other cells. So next slide, please. So this is an illustration of how a... Um, a cell can sort of uh, uh, make microRNAs and then package them into these vesicles and then the vesicles can enter the bloodstream shown there in the middle and uh, exit the bloodstream at some, at some distant point in the body and um, enter cells and, and um, regulate gene expression within those cells. Next slide, please. So because microRNAs are found in many of our body fluids, uh, they are emerging as attractive biomarkers of the sort of um, type like circulating tumor DNA or circulating tumor cells. Um, however, one thing that, that, that we and others have noticed is that while circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor DNA are found at very low levels within the blood, microRNAs can be found at very high levels and, and, and are easy to detect within the blood. Um, as John mentioned, they're very stable, they're packaged in vesicles or they're um, incorporated into the argonaut risk complex and they, and they can survive um, uh, harsh conditions in the blood. They can also survive harsh conditions of freezing and thawing and um, fixation. And so microRNAs can be detected in um, retrospective studies of samples that have been frozen or, or, or uh, fixated um, decades ago. So next slide, please. So um, while we discovered the first human microRNA um, in Gary Rifkin's lab uh, back in the year 2000, it was only in the year 2008 in a, in a big surprise that 
uh, groups were, were, were able to show that microRNAs could be detected in blood. And um, at about the same time as that happened, a number of companies were starting to, to develop microRNA-based diagnostics for, uh, for uh, prognosis or um, early detection. The first one was, was launched by a company called Rosetta, and um, it allowed physicians to um, determine the, the, the site of origin of a tumor that had caused a metastasis where, where it wasn't clear where the, um, where the metastasis had actually um, arisen from. Um, over, the, over the course of the next 10 years or so, a number of uh, governmental and um, um, uh, other organizations launched programs in trying to sort of translate these discoveries into, into new biomarkers, including um, and in, in Singapore, um, in uh, the United States, and in Japan. In 2014, the first um, insurance reimbursable test based on, on a microRNA uh, came out from Interpace. This was a microRNA-based assay that could detect uh, thyroid cancer within patients. And um, since, since then, we've seen a number of different microRNA panels being approved, um, mostly in Asia. At this point, there are no microRNA-based panels that are, that are um, uh, of, of sort of multiple microRNA-based, multiple microRNAs and signatures that, that have been approved yet in the United States, although it, it probably won't be long before that happens. As I'll show in the next slide, there are a number of different clinical trials that are happening in this space, and so, so it, it surely won't be long. So one reason why I'm excited about this particular launch tonight, this particular standards and why I got involved is because I've been working in the space a long time and I've realized just how variable everybody's assays are and just how um, tightly controlled one needs to, to, to perform these sorts of experiments. There are variability, there's variability that, that's introduced by how the sample is collected, how the sample is stored, how long it's stored, what, what type of tissue one um, one uh, generates the RNAs from, and then uh, which assay one uses to detect the RNA, and then also how one standardizes to, to, to sort of normalize expression. And so with Merexis, I've been very um, excited to, 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 to sort of work with them to try and develop a standard that would be applicable through, uh, throughout the world. And um, I'm very happy to see that the standard has been approved in Singapore, and that it's now being discussed at the international level as well. And so another reason why I'm so excited is if you, if you look in the next slide, next slide, please. Um, if you just do a, a, a search through clinicaltrials.gov, which is a database of all the clinical trials that are happening around the world, and you search for clinical trials involving microRNAs, well, you can see there in the top middle that there are over 900 clinical trials at the moment involving microRNAs as mostly as diagnostic biomarkers, but there are others uh, that, are, that, are, that are involving microRNAs as therapeutic targets as well. And so we're, we're, we're probably on the cusp of seeing a number of these biomarker panels being approved for a variety of different um, cancer and, and, and other disease indications, uh, especially for early detection, but also as was mentioned for, uh, uh, for prognosis and for predictive biomarkers. And it's gonna be increasingly important that we trust the veracity of the assays and we can trust the data, especially certain companies that are, that are, that are moving these, these assays into clinical trials. Um, they would almost certainly want to make certain that the, uh, that the assay is robust and that they're getting um, the best possible data from, from each sample. And so with that, I'm gonna close and just say um, congratulations to the team for, for getting this together. And I look forward to, to your standard being um, applied more broadly. Thanks, for, thanks everybody. Hello, uh, can I speak now? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, so um, good day and good evening everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's great uh, honor today uh, to join you for this uh, major launch event and to also share with you uh, my view on the challenges 
or give other people thanks for neutralizing the microRNA boost. Uh, we all know, um, so next slide. We all know that biomarkers are playing an increasingly important role today for successful drug development and for patient care. From understanding disease mechanism, disease status, monitoring disease progressions, predicting and optimizing treatment, and monitoring clinical outcomes, many biomarkers can be developed into diagnostic for various applications including risk identification, like a BRCA1, BRCA2, those type of, you know, markers, or for screening, again, BRCA1, BRCA2, PSA are a good example, diagnosis, prognosis, predictive, or dynamic monitoring, monitoring whether disease relapse, resistance, or uh, minimal residual disease. Um, although many biomarkers have been successful into diagnostic tests, Majority, I would say probably 99.9% of the markers never Hello? Oh, okay. Okay. The next slide, please. So um, this this video is, uh, on the slide are a uh, little bit uh, old, uh, but was based on my re uh, on research, a very quick PubMed research. So the graph on the left shows that, um, summarized the sum uh, number of published articles in PubMed that re reported microRNA or messenger RNA or methylation-based biomarker assays. In uh, the gray bars representing the total um, articles reported as the essay for each type of biomarker. The orange bar are the articles mentioned uh, or presented um, signature. Signature is meaning a panel of microRNA or a panel of methylation uh, markers or messenger RNA. And the blue bar uh, are the articles actually present a AUC curve that described the performance of the signature assay. So these were um, from data from PubMed that I searched 2000 to 2020. So based on that quick, quick search, you can see anywhere from 100 to 40,000 paper have been published for this different type of biomarker with or without a signature AUC. However, on the uh, left, look at R, uh, I, first, I want to apologize. There's a some error in the, the graph. The numbers are collected, but the, the graph wasn't updated. I first did that analysis uh, uh, in 2016. And so the, the graph was done in 2016, but after that, in this May, uh, 2020 May, I went back to the ESI, look at how many um, messenger RNA based the biomarker signature versus methylation versus microRNA based uh, signature that have been approved by US FDA, not including any in other country. So you can see there's very, very few that have been uh, approved by FDA. And the first gene expression based test was actually approved back in 2007. Uh, and as of May, 2020, only six uh, messenger RNA gene expression based tests have been approved by US FDA. I think two of the six were related to colon cancer, Cologar as well as um, Epicolon, I believe. Um, and then not one single microRNA based test has been approved by US FDA. So I want to take this opportunity to, to congratulate Myrex that having the first microRNA based test approved by Singapore government. I think that's a one major uh, milestone. Uh, as uh, Frank mentioned, there are uh, two LDT launched in the US, which is one is for thyroid cancer, the other one was actually the very first one uh, by Rosetta Genomic. And there are several in Asia, but none in US that was uh, approved by US FDA. And one thing I also want to uh, emphasize, US FDA approval does not guarantee successful commercialization. Must be able to uh, demonstrate clinical utility. The reason I want to mention that is uh, if you look at my uh, figure 
the graph on the right hand side, uh, there's one star that I say including gene search. Gene search was actually uh, the first uh, gene expression tech that was approved by FDA. Uh, shortly after it was launched, it got taken out of the market uh, because the, the workflow is very difficult and also uh, there's limited clinical utility. So this is the one lesson learned uh, by many uh, IVD industry. Having FDA approval does not guarantee commercial success. So next slide. So why is it so hard? Uh, so much effort on biomarker uh, identification, study, essay, you know, all the essay performance being reported, but very few get it to get to the uh, regulatory approval and get to the market. So why is that? So since today uh, we are talking about microRNA standard launch in Singapore, so I'm using microRNA for lung cancer as an example. The top graph uh, on the X are each one of the microRNA, each individual microRNA. The Y axis are the number of times in the article search that I carry out back in 2016. Um, so the, the data would be very different today. But back then, um, just to show you, uh, only one microRNA that been reported four times out of the 16 article, only one microRNA that reported four times. So four out of 16. So that tells you uh, there's some kind of reproducibility issue. Majority of the, uh, of the microRNA reported that are highly associated with lung cancer, they have been reported only one time and they were never reproduced by other articles or other researchers. You look at the bottom, on the other hand, all of these microRNAs that have been reported for various different cancers, the number one microRNA that are that is most, most cited by lung cancer on the top is microRNA 21, which is also reported 10 times, all right? which is also reported in 10 different cancers. So therefore, that's another issue, specificity. So I'm using cancer as an example. Out of that 10 different, uh, 19 different cancers, one microRNA is reported in, in, in 10 uh, different cancers. So you have reproducibility issue, you have specific issue. So why is that? Well, as, as Frank mentioned, oftentimes these microRNAs are very small, very difficult to quantitate. So the sensitivity and specificity of the assay uh, analytical uh, performance is, is extremely uh, important. So next slide, please. Um, so, uh, what are the key challenges? So, uh, we already uh, talked about the analytical variability and uh, Frank mentioned that. But in reality, when you develop any biomarker assay, there are many types of different variability that we need to overcome. The first variability is the biological variability. When you take a, a, a tube of blood or a piece of tissue, what you see in that tube of blood and what you see in that piece of tissue is a snapshot. The biomarkers are constantly changing, whether you are running just now or whether you are stopping fasting overnight or whether you just been very dehydrated or have a big, you know, fatty meal, that changes your biomarker. Everything you do changes your biomarker. So what you measure, regardless of what tool you use, it's a snapshot. So we have to understand the biological variability. That's just something we can not control very well, but we have to understand it very well. But on top of that, the sample quality, how you collect the sample, how you store the sample, how you cut the sample, those are pre-analytical variability. And then on top of that, you have different tools, different reagents, different mm -hmm. detection methods. All of these added on to the variability. These are analytical variability. And after you finish all that, you have lot to lot reagents. So the reagent provider, the manufacturer, are many who manufacturing these uh, reagents, they have process variability, they have raw material variability, et cetera, and operator variability during manufacturing. So all these variabilities stacking up. And, and then by the time you have 5%, 10% here, then your total variability is what? You don't know, right? So that's, that's the reason why it is that difficult to develop a very robust um, any biomarker assay, especially multivariate. 
uh, whether it's a microRNA or messenger RNA. So next slide, please. So the key is that we need to understand and control um, the various different types and the source of the variability. So to develop and commercialize the uh, novel biomarker-based diagnostic test, uh, it's very important. First of all, you have to have very robust biomarker discovery and development, and always start with the end in mind. So make sure your analytical tools are robust, control the simple quality and pre-analytical variability, understand the biological variability. For example, do you need to have, you know, collect the sample uh, after fasting or not? Uh, if it's a urine sample, is that first new or not? Whatever. So you need to understand the biological variability. And, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, very importantly, you have to develop your biomarker, discover and develop your biomarker with a appropriate uh, samples and study designs, including using the right intended population for the intended use. That's what I meant uh, with the end in mind and statistic power and understand what are the potential bias and compounders, et cetera. And then uh, following that, uh, you need to make sure uh, you have very robust performance for the diagnostic assay for the intended use. Um, so very comprehensive analytical validation would be required. And of course, uh, ideally you would uh, follow the requirement and guideline to make sure everything works well. And then prospective validation, again, follow the guideline um, with the intended population for in intended use and in appropriate study design with statistic power. And finally, very importantly, you have to demonstrate clinical utility to help drive guideline adoption uh, and, and to help drive reimbursement. Um, if you don't have guideline adoption and with you don't have a strong clinical utility, you cannot achieve reimbursement. If you cannot achieve reimbursement, then the global adoption would be uh, pretty difficult. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, microRNA-based uh, uh, diagnostic, um, it's particularly uh, challenging, but at the same time, it also offers a great opportunity. So if you look at the microRNA, it, it is um, very, every single one of microRNA, so shown as this video, Actually, uh, blocking this. Okay, so um, the the microRNAs. Uh, this is uh, one of the review uh, paper that, that are specifically looking at microRNA in the database uh, with uh, a set of was to analyze the network, the pathway, and mapping all the microRNA pathways together uh, for primary hypertension uh, disease. And uh, the minimum common microRNAs are for, for uh, each one of the microRNA uh, annotations that in the minimum of the, the target gene that are tight or related are thousand. So you have anywhere from 600 to you know, almost 6,000 genes that are incited. And if you look at the gene network, it's quite complicated. A lot, a lot of crosstalks and a lot of uh, loops. So that tells you this is a vast uh, atrophy of microRNA activity. So one single microRNA can regulate many networks, many pathways. And so it is therefore very difficult uh, to actually pinpoint which microRNA for a specific diagnosis, uh, a disease diagnosis. Um, so the lack of specificity uh, on the pathological status of any given uh, microRNA, and that's the major challenge. However, because um, these microRNAs are a zero serving as a regulator, they can provide deep insight into the complexity of the gene regulation, molecular pathway, prospect, uh, crosswalks, feedback loops, and, and the case case, et cetera, and, and provide us an opportunity to, to better understand what are the interactions between the pathways. And that that and those molecular mechanisms that underlie the disease onset and progression and as well as uh, uh, all the, those associated comorbidities. So I think microRNA really, because of its complexity, because of its regulatory network, it provides us a, a tool to better understand in, uh, in depth uh, and broadly uh, the disease, the phenotype and, and the associated mechanisms. 
Um, also, because of, um, there are many microRNA, you know, um, several microRNA will regulate one path, one microRNA will regulate many different paths. So therefore, the opportunity is that you could potentially identify microRNAs, a panel of microRNAs, to detect a highly heterogeneous disease because this uh, panel of microRNA may be able to shed light and cover all the uh, disease uh, regulations and mechanisms that uh, that will help diagnose the disease, whether at early or at advanced stage. So next slide. So um, uh, looking forward, uh, given that uh, you know, microRNA is a um, much more stable uh, molecule, um, it, it provides a very good uh, tool for us to better understand the disease mechanism and potentially developing a uh, microRNA-based signature for diagnosis. I'm very hopeful, looking forward, that this uh, standard uh, that we just launched will actually help us not only to develop uh, uh, robust diagnostic tools for various different clinical applications, but also will help uh, develop insights for drug uh, discovery, drug development, and to achieve a microRNA-based precision medicine. So um, with that, uh, I want to conclude my talk, and I want to congratulate everyone who has worked on this um, uh, standard and who has uh, made contributions to this standard. So thank you again. Frank and John, uh, for the for bringing us through the last 20 years since my coronary was uh, first discovered by Frank. Uh, as the previous three speakers alluded to, I think there has been a lot of excitement about the biology and the potential of microRNA in illustrating some of the information that's very unique to microRNA uh, that's not found in DNA, mRNA, or proteins. But there has also been an um, equal number of disappointments during this whole process in the last 20 years. What we're very glad is the biology of microRNA is becoming very clear and its potential in commercial application. And what we are also glad is the challenges seems to be in the process of how we are discovering these biomarkers and developing the assay. Uh, my belief is that all process challenges can be resolved. And this is why we're very glad that the Singapore National Standard SS656 is now in place uh, to guide all of us, not only in Asia, but I think across the globe, everybody that's working on microRNAs to then have a unified approach uh, to bring a biomarker from discovery all the way down to a clinically uh, implementable assay. So I'm going to take uh, the journey um, of uh, developing GastroClear, uh, which is a, uh, a world, the world's first stomach cancer microRNA screening test uh, done in blood, and share with you uh, what are the many challenges we have learned, and also I think some of the valuable lessons that we believe will benefit uh, everyone else. So. Uh, this test is uh, designed, developed, and manufactured in Singapore, um, and it received a home country approval in uh, May 2019. And um, this is the first uh, stomach cancer microRNA uh, uh, blood test that's been approved globally. Why did we look at stomach cancer? Well, it is remains to be the third most deadly cancer in the world, although the incident rate has been dropping, but Basically, by the time stomach cancer patients uh, show symptoms, it's often very late. So screening measures are extremely important. Um, across the globe, Japan and Korea have the highest um, prognosis, uh, the best prognosis for gastric cancer patients because they implement national endoscope-based screening, which is frankly is not uh, uh, applicable in many of the other countries without the level of infrastructure and uh, also have medium to low prevalence of gastric cancer. So when we first got into developing a stomach cancer screening assay, it was really out of the request of many clinicians to ask for a tool, a simple tool, which is accurate, affordable, actionable, to help screen the asymptomatic population before subjecting or referring the high-risk patients to do an endoscope. So its clinical utility is in looking for early detection in asymptomatic patients, and at the same time, help to make the whole screening process more affordable for the entire healthcare system. 
Um, it was an eight-year effort uh, starting in 2012, led by Professor Yu Kei Guan, our lead PI from the Singapore Gastric Cancer Consortium, but also combining the effort across the globe. Uh, in Singapore, we have NUH, uh, TTSH, and uh, John has mentioned uh, DXD Hub um, as, at its establishment in 2014, really helped guide us through the whole process of developing and designing the assay. Uh, School of Public Health in NUS helped us to look at to the health economics and of course the foreign uh, hospitals that has participated in the whole effort in Korea, in Japan, in China, as well as Vanderbilt uh, in uh, the United States. So this was really a collective international effort in the last eight years that brought the test uh, to its flutation. Now, this is a PCR-based test, and uh, I think what COVID pandemic has brought us is really uh, globally, everyone now can talk about PCR. Everyone seems to know about RNA, which is great for uh, molecular diagnostics. But very briefly, uh, which I believe Ling will share in a lot more detail, uh, the clinical laboratory workflow of this um, is a four-step process where the microRNA is isolated from the clinical sample, in this case, serum, um, converted into a cDNA, detected using a qPCR process, and subjected to data analysis, where the uh, sample to result time within the lab uh, can be done within four hours. And as Union has alluded to, um, there are many analytical and biological uh, uh, variants that can happen across a whole process. So how do we best control that so that we can get the best biology out of these microRNAs? Uh, we're also very glad upon approval of GastroClear in Singapore. Uh, this is the only microRNA test that was featured in the Nature Biotech article when we talk more about cancer liquid biopsy, early detection, and precision medicine, alongside with the DNA sequencing tests, methylation tests, and some of the earlier protein tests. So officially, it was a six-year journey from uh, a biomarker discovery to the finishing of the clinical validation prior to a regulatory submission. And why did we take six years? And that was precisely the many challenges that uh, Yulian has highlighted. In order to fully illustrate the potential of these biomarkers, uh, it took us many iterations from discovery to verification to assay development and ultimately the clinical validation. And the clinical prospective clinical study alone took three years from 2016 to 2018. Uh, why did we take that long? Is because we wanted to illustrate really not only the clinical performance, but the clinical utility of a microRNA test. So we enrolled uh, on a high-risk population basis, um, uh, a total of 5,282 participants, all of which had a blood test and all of whom had an endoscope as a reference point. So within this population, there was 2.5% of cancer and the blood was collected prior to, uh, to any of these diagnoses. So, and after going through this whole process, uh, eventually 4,566 of these were uh, included in the analysis. We had 115 of the gastric cancer cases, uh, 10 high-grade dysplasia. And what the microRNA test was able to show is gastric cancer is one of the diseases where we really lack a good blood-based biomarker. And what has been implemented in uh, high-risk countries in Asia, uh, China, Korea, Japan, you will see H. pylori, which is a bacteria that causes infection in the stomach, which puts the, the patient at very high risk of developing gastric cancer, pepsinogen 1 and 2. And when we compare the microRNA assay uh, in the prospective clinical validation, the, um, we were able to elevate the accuracy as compared to the existing biomarker by more than 20% um, uh, in the AUC. And even in high-grade dysplasia, which is known as the stage 0 gastric cancer, um, the AUC is also 25% better as compared to existing biomarkers. So we are very excited about the performance of this, uh, these biomarkers. And what's even more exciting to the clinicians is the great correlation of the sensitivity of this assay in detecting early stage of uh, gastric cancer. And uh, if you look at figure B over here, uh, there is also a good correlation uh, uh, according to the lesion size. So this is something that John and Frank has alluded to. Uh, many of these microRNAs come from the cancer tissue itself. And of course, it makes sense that when we have a bigger tumor, there are 
greater shedding of these microRNAs into the circulation and therefore a higher sensitivity. And upon approval uh, last year in May, uh, what was um, uh, I think all of us got very excited about is uh, we managed to implement this in one of the community screening project uh, uh, launched by the Singapore Pri uh, Prime Minister. Uh, we offered the test to screen 242 uh, elderly uh, asymptomatic individuals uh, uh, and uh, we're monitoring two of those that has been identified uh, as high risk. So coming back to the standard, why are we so excited? It's because we have learned so much. We have made so many mistakes along the six-year journey and we wanted to make sure other people don't repeat the same mistake and we wanted to make sure our regulators understand uh, the pros and cons of developing microRNA diagnostics and what to watch out for. So uh, John has also shared part of this and Yulian has alluded to this as well. It is a very long process and each of these steps must be aligned and controlled very well or else uh, any failure in any one of these steps could result in the eventual failure of the test, uh, which I believe is, is why uh, up to today, you know, not as many uh, RNA-based tests has been implemented. So why is microRNA unique? There has been other standards that talk about the development of DNA tests, the development uh, of protein tests. And call to that is really the size of the microRNA. Uh, it's extremely small. So the typical chemistry that works for the bigger analytes really do not work for uh, microRNA. And the considerations in analytical and clinical variability would be different. So you look at this graph. Um, in order for something to be able to implement clinically, the assay must be robust uh, itself. The left-hand side is a typical research uh, grade assay that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work very well. But in order for clinical implementation, we really need something as robust as what's shown on the right-hand side. And that has to be consistent across the hundreds and thousands of microRNA. And that is not an easy task. And what makes this even more challenging is when we look at the circulating microRNAs, the very high abundance ones, uh, which you mentioned, uh, that's been shedding by uh, various tissues, those are not as informative as uh, some of the lower expression ones, which are secreted only by selected cells or tissues. And coupling the small size of these microRNAs and the less abundance of these microRNAs, the development process, the assay becomes extremely important. So we became very obsessed uh, with quality, with control, and, and this is really, I think, the slide uh, that we used to convince uh, Frank and, and Julian to work with us, where we talk about excessive control of every single possible step in order to remove the analytical variability to fully illustrate the biology of microRNA. And again, an often forgotten part of the quality control process uh, is sample collection, which many of our uh, researchers or, or, or even commercial companies uh, may or may not have uh, um, uh, fully understood the importance of quality control in the sample collection process because ultimately for any test, it's garbage in, garbage out. So we are very glad in the SS656, uh, we don't only talk about the control of the development process, the thinking, but also we highlighted the need to control for sample uh, collection and processing. So I won't go into details, uh, but if you look at um, uh, uh, the way the SS656 is structured, uh, we believe this will offer really a, a great framework for anyone who's interested in microRNA biomarker or candidate discovery to think about what are the processes, what are the pros and cons, and what are the things to watch out for. And uh, we're hoping that this will also provide a framework to the regulators, not only in Asia and uh, uh, um, also in FDA, uh, that this is how we are approaching uh, development of microRNA, which is different from the other assay development. And hopefully by the collective effort, we'll be able to push more microRNA IVD tests through the regulatory approval and a greater clinical adoption. So we ourselves are um, very excited to apply uh, SS656 to guide any of our other microRNA assay development, as well as the broader sense of RNA diagnostic tests. And um, 
The first one we are applying that to um, is the lung cancer microRNA test, which we are conducting a fairly large global effort. And the reason, and it's also mentioned in SS656, is the key to any RNA or microRNA-based expression level assays is to make sure that the performance is consistent across uh, different countries uh, with different ethnic group with different disease biology. So we are applying that to uh, the lung cancer test development. And interestingly, as, uh, as it was mentioned, um, uh, this year we pivoted some of our capabilities to assist in the national effort in ramping up uh, the COVID-19 RT-PCR test. And interestingly, we actually applied many of the learnings um, uh, that's written in SS656 to the development uh, manufacturing and validation of Fortitude, uh, which is essentially an RNA-based test. So glad to share that uh, the blue dots are all the countries that Fortitude has been de uh, deployed to. And we look forward to the day when uh, microRNA tests will be uh, deployed in as many countries as the COVID-19 test. So uh, with that, um, I just want to say our gratitude as a industry member to um, the national body and the many people who has uh, participated and launched the SS656 in really a record speed from November uh, to now. And we also like to thank our, our resource members, um, Frank and Yulian, for guiding us through this whole process. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you speakers. So for uh, just a reminder to all participants, this webinar will be recorded and can be accessed online after the after this webinar. So for our next speaker is Dr. Go Liu Ling, who will be going through the application of SS656 in a clinical diagnostic setting. So Dr. Go is the Senior Principal Scientific Officer of Dandoxing Hospital, and she supports the personalized medicine services and oversees the molecular diagnostics laboratory. She has a strong interest in liquid biopsy research and its clinical applications. Today, she will provide insights into the validation of mRNA-based assays for clinical use. So let us welcome Dr. Go, please. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to share briefly about our laboratory and the type of work we conducted. The TTSH Molecular Diagnostic Lab is set up in 2014 to support the research activities and translational projects for our institution. In 2017, the lab is CAP accredited to provide clinical testing for our patients. Now, most of our molecular tests are for disease management, uh, where we evaluate biomarkers or genetic variations uh, for, the, for diagnosis, targeted therapy, and monitoring. There has also been a lot of interest in early disease detection. In fact, we are seeing this paradigm shift from sick care to health care. And we think early disease detection is uh, getting more important and the rationale is obvious because if we can detect the disease early, the patients tend to have better prognosis and they can seek treatment earlier and that would also be translated to the reduction of healthcare costs and burden. Last year, we launched the blood-based microRNA-based screening assay, which you heard about uh, from Li Han earlier, it's called GastroClear. Now, this is a screening test for gastric cancer. Uh, what we did is to measure the expression of multiple microRNAs. The, re the, in the results of the individual microRNA will be combined in an algorithm to calculate a risk score. So for patients who are tested as high risk, then they will be recommended to go for gastroscopy if it's also clinically indicated. This slide shows you the typical processes that we took before a test is implemented for clinical use. We have to evaluate its clinical utility. You have to check whether there's a business case for it. Is it scientifically sound? What are the clinical performance of the assays? We also have to consider the laboratory workflow for sample receive, pre-processing all the way to reporting. It's important to validate the test to ensure that it is accurate, it's robust and reproducible. You also have to think about your quality assurance program and what I mean here is uh, proficiency testing. If the lab is not available in the proficiency testing manual, uh, what we can do is to perform a specimen exchange with another laboratory. So everything is uh, well and good. You're ready to share the test with your clinician and work out your test request route. 
Although these are pretty standard uh, procedures in most of the molecular laboratory, um, there are special considerations when one works with microRNA, RNA, especially the pre-processing steps. And I have highlighted the relevant sections in the S656 standard in blue over here. So what I'm going to do in this uh, presentation is to share our experience in validating GastroClear for clinical use and highlight some of the uh, important considerations. As mentioned earlier, the first step is to evaluate the clinical utility. So indeed, um, gastric cancer is clinically important. It has a low five-year survival rate, often because it was detected rate, uh, late. So there's a clinical need for it. We talk to the stake relevant stakeholders, like our colleagues from the Department of uh, Gastric uh, Gastro uh, Endo, yeah, uh, the Health Screening Clinic, uh, to get their professional opinions as well as their buy-in. It's important to evaluate the scientific validity of the test. So what we did is to conduct a literature search to ensure that there's a clear link between the microRNA biomarkers and the clinical condition. It is important to evaluate the clinical performance of the test. Uh, these are important because the clinician are going to ask you the values. So it's important to have this ready before you even talk to them. Ideally, is to evaluate the data from actual clinical use. But because this gastroclear is uh, rather new, so there wasn't much uh, clinical experience data, but there are proof of concept studies conducted that we can evaluate. So for an effective uh, screening test, we will be looking at its sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive values. So before I show some of the actual data, I would just like to go through the concept and the termino terminology here. So let's first look at sensitivity and specificity. These values can be calculated from a standard 2x2 two two table, where the test results are compared to the results of the disease or the gold standard. In sensitivity, we are really looking at the fraction of those tested positive in all with disease. And for specificity, we'll be looking at all those tested negative in people without disease. So these values will reflect the accuracy of the test. So for a screening test, we are really looking for high detection rate and low false positive rate. In other words, we want something like say 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. But in real life, that's not going to be the case because we are going to see some false positive and false negative as shown in the plot here. And these values are determined by the cutoff chosen. Now just to share with you the concept of the cutoff, if I'm going to shift the cutoff a little bit to the left, what you see is that the sensitivity will increase. We're going to pick up everyone with the disease. However, the specificity will decrease because some of those without the disease are going to be tested positive. So how do we determine the optimum cutoff? We can actually use the ROC curve to help us. In this plot, uh, the true positive rate or sensitivity is plotted against the false positive rate. For different cutoff points and the best cutoff point will give you the highest true positive rate together with the lowest false positive rate. All right. Besides that, we also look at the area under the curve that will be used to measure the how good the test is in a given clinical situation. So in the clinical context, anything more than 0 0.9 will be considered very good. Between 0.7 to 0.9 will be moderate. 0.5 to 0.69 will be considered low and anything below 0 0.5 is not acceptable. So on this plot, um, it's very obvious that A has a better performance than B. And anything below the dotted line should not be used for clinical purposes. Let's look at the uh, actual data from, the, from our industrial partners. They perform a prospective cohort of symptomatic patients. And when I first look at the number size, I think it's reasonable, 4,566. The AUC value is 0 0.85, so it's considered moderately good. Um, and it performs better than other blood-based biomarkers such as the pexinogen and helicobacter pylori infection. We look at the sensitivity and the specificity. It's about 44% and 93.94% respectively when the cutoff is at 50 
The performance characteristic is better in asymptomatic high-risk population and newly diagnosed patients. They perform another validation study in a local cohort. The sensitivity has increased to 81% and subsequently verified in another cohort is 82%. So we are rather pleased with the performance characteristics. I like to share a little bit on uh, predictive values. A lot of times they are not in the literature, but these are important because it will help the clinician to discuss the results with the patient. The positive predictive value is defined as how likely one tested positive has the disease. And the negative predictive value is defined as how likely one tested negative does not have the disease. And these values are affected by sensitivity, specificity, as well as the prevalence of the condition in the target population. I showed this earlier, just to show you that the PPV and MPV can also be calculated in the same two by two table. It's just that this time we will consider the values across the rows uh, instead of down the columns. So sensitivity and specificity will reflect the accuracy of the test, but the predicted values will, is related to the likelihood of the condition. Just to illustrate to you the effects of prevalence on the predictive values, let's say you have an assay with very high sensitivity and specificity of 90%. Now, in a given population of 2,000, when the prevalence is high, you will have a high PPV and MPV values of 90% which are actually very close, or in fact, exactly the same as our sensitivity and specificity. However, when the prevalence is low, you will notice that the PPV decreased to 8.3% and the MPV increased slightly to 99.9%. So these are the values from the same cohort study uh, shared earlier. The PPV is 16.98% and the MPV is 98%. 0.35%. In other words, for a patient or an individual tested a negative, then most likely um, the person has a very low risk for gastric cancer. I'm going to move on to workflow. Li Han showed earlier that there are four major steps in gastro clear. The pre-processing step where we, spin, where we spin the blood tubes and then one needs to isolate the microRNA from the supernatant perform a cDNA followed by amplification and fluorescent detection. Now, there are several considerations uh, in the workflow, especially for sample processing because of the stringent requirement to spin the blood tube within a certain time frame. So one has to really work out the logistic with the clinics as well as external labs. But once the blood tube has been spun, they can then be stored in at minus 80 degrees freezer, if not at least a minus 20 degrees freezer. So it's important to consider the resources available in the lab. In this case, we don't have much problem with the equipment because we have the thermocyclo, the real-time PCR instrument, and our people need minimum training in performing the test because they're already familiar with RNA work as well as a liquid biopsy, although they do need some training in terms of result interpretation, troubleshooting, and handling inquiries. We have to plan long-term whether we can scale up the test as because it's working on the 384 well, so it will be good, and especially when the load is high, to have a liquid handler to help. The turnaround time is determined or guided by the urgency of the clinical management. So if we have to churn out the results pretty, you know, within a very short time frame, we have to see how it will affect other workflows in our laboratory. It's important to have the relevant controls, not only for the validation, but also for subsequent quality assurance program. We have to think about how we can automate the analysis, how, what, what, goes, what goes inside our report, can we standardize it, and how we can integrate it with our LIM system. I will move on to analytical validation. This is the process um, prior to implementation to demonstrate that the test delivers reliable results for the intended application. Now, typically, we will have to decide on the number of specimens to be tested, what are the relevant specimen type? In this case, would be blood samples. We have to determine the accuracy, the precision, the limit of detection, the reportable range. So we have to set the criteria and make sure that we pass all of this. Because this is an IVD, CIVD kit, so for some of the parameters like interference, carryover, assay stability, and cross-reactivity, we can obtain the information from the manufacturer and state in our validation report. 
just to share with you some of the data during our validation of GastroClear. Accuracy refers to the degree to which a result conforms to the correct value or a standard. So we run 50 clinical samples in parallel with another laboratory and check for concordance. So we find that 92% of the samples are, con are in concordance. And for those few that are discordant, it's because they are very near the cutoff or at 50. Precision refers to the degree to which repeated test results on the same sample agree. So we perform both intra-assay as well as inter-assay precision. For intra-assay precision, we basically test the samples in duplicates within the same run. And for inter-assay precision, uh, we have the same set of samples run by different technologies on different days. So three spike-in samples were used for this and we passed the criteria. Now, limit of detection refers to the lowest analyte concentration, allowing consistent differentiation from the limit of blank. In this case, it's water. So what we did is to perform a serial dilution using synthetic microRNA to obtain the lowest detectable concentration indicated by the manufacturer. So this our dilution can also be used to verify your reportable range. Back to LOD, the passing criteria will be the percentage of all measurements with a CT value less than that of the LOB must be less than 85%, must be more than 85%. And the CT value standard deviation must be less than 0 0.5. And as you can see in the table, we pass the criteria. So this is my last slide. I'll share a little bit on how we should evaluate the clinical utility of the test and what are some of the special considerations as well as uh, the validation procedure. The standard will provide more information, especially on the collection, handling and isolation of microRNA, not just for blood samples, but also for other specimen types like tissues or other bi uh, biological fluids. There's also a section on, on the guidelines for reporting, which will be helpful for the clinical lab. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Go Liu Ling. So for our last presentation, let us welcome Mr. Danny Ong, who will be talking about as how SS656 ties in and supports the regulators. So Mr. Danny Ong is the Senior Regulatory Specialist in the Medical Device Cluster in Health Sciences Authority, and he has been working in the area of medical device regulation for the last seven years. So prior to joining HSA, he was doing design and development of molecular diagnostic assays for a local IVD company. And he has also worked as a scientific officer in the diagnostic lab. So, Mr. Danny Yong, please. Thank you, Long Hoi. Hi, I'm uh, Danny from HSA. Yeah, so, um, after going through all your scientific information, I will um, briefly bring you through the regulations uh, of medical devices in Singapore and how it ties in and, and support um, our, our regulators. So, yeah, very briefly. Um, I will bring through the, the possible risk classification for medical devices uh, for your miRNA IVD assays and then the regulatory um, controls of uh, IVDs in Singapore and um, what are the submission um, requirements for, for product re registration and, and how the information actually ties in very well with your uh, SS565 um, standard. So, okay, so this is the, the table of risk classification. Um, it's in one of our guidance documents called the GN14. So if you look at it, the medical devices um, for IVDs, they are classified into four um, risk class from class A to class D. Class A being the lowest um, risk and uh, class D being the highest risk. So this is um, actually titrated um, according to the risk to individual health um, and the risk to public health. For example, if something that is uh, that tends to, to spread very easily and and harms the, the, the patient very very um, much, it actually goes into higher risk. Like your COVID nineteen currently, these are the highest risk class um, uh, medical devices. So um, for miRNA IVD assays, currently they are more likely to fall into class B or class C um, IVDs. The the miRNA is still still very new in the IVD space. Currently, majority of the assays that we see are cancer related. So all these are, are going into class C um, IVDs, but we foresee there will be some uh, that, that 
is for these there are for diseases that that may not be so so um adverse they may fall into class b um there is a possibility of it going into class d but um currently i can't think of any examples for 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 that Okay, so for the key regulatory controls for medical devices, we, we split it into pre-market and post-market. So we see three, three um, sectors over there. Um, for pre-market, it's controlled by dealer's controls. That's basically your licenses. Um, so for, for medical device licenses, we group them into manuf manufacturer's license, your importer's license, and your wholesaler's licenses. So for a medical device company, to be able to deal with medical device, uh, whether it's to, to ma manufacture or to import and wholesale, they will need to have uh, uh, licenses. So this licensing controls the, the company itself. Um, the second portion is on um, product control. So this is specific for um, each product. So for example, if a medical com uh, device company um, manufactures five um, medical devices, all these five products, if they are are uh, of high risk they need to be registered and evaluated by hsa um, before they can be supplied um, in singapore so uh, thereafter uh, is the other uh, post post market controls so we look at um, compliance to our regulation and then um, ae is adverse event few uh, fsca is field safety corrective um, action so where a medical device um, um, has problems they will be reported to, to HSA and then we will act promptly on it to um, resolve the, the issues with the, the medical device. So um, I, I won't talk too much about the, um, the dealer's licenses and post-market because they are not quite um, relevant to SS656. So um, this is on product registration. So when a, a company submits um, a, a medical device for product registration, this is briefly the, the documents that they require. So um, the, the ones in box in red, number six and seven, on design VNV and um, clinical evidence, they are the, um, the main technical portions or that, that the company um, actually submits. So this portion, we have a, a detailed document uh, called TR02 that contains the, the document, documentary requirements for, for these IVDs. So this is um, from TR02, you see we listed down um, the list of preclinicals and clinical studies um, from your analytical sensitivity and specificity all the way to your clinical uh, sensitivity and specificity. So if you actually look at it, um, each um, list or each study that we, we have listed down actually has a section uh, um, covered um, by SS656. So um, this standard actually explains in context to, to MI, RNA, IVD essays, the, the preclinical and clinical study requirements listed in TR2. So it, it helps provide um, a common understanding on how the study should be performed for MI, RNA essays. So this, this is actually good because um, in the very early, early stages of development, um, it is important for the, the developers to be, to be on track to um, what they need to, to do for, for validation. Because if they were to get it wrong in, in, in the beginning, by the time they, they submit their, their data for, for registration uh, and we feedback to them on the potential problems, they have to go back to the bench and, and redo the test. And this would actually delay uh, the, the launch or the approval of the, the device itself. So um, actually this is my, my last slide. Uh, just want to finish off with um, the, the medical device product um, life cycle. So um, if you look at the bar, bar below, yeah, the SS656 actually provides um, a lot of information from the, the early stages of, of development um, all the way to um, the, the portion before uh, they submit for, for regulatory approval. So um, the life cycle of medical device doesn't, doesn't end with product registration. It goes down to um, post-market monitoring. So the company monitors that. Um, HSA also monitors um, what is in the market. And any potential problems, um, it is actually uh, fed back um, to, the, to the front. So if there's any potential problems, they may modify the, 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 
the device, um, put it back for more, more validation work um, before creating a, a newer version to the, to the IVD medical device. So um, this is all for my presentation. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Danny Yong. So we have come to the end of the webinar. So we'll be going on with the Q&A. So uh, maybe just give us a minute to prepare for the Q&A. So if you have not uh, input your questions into the to the chat, the pop-up box at the right side, please remember to. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I'm back. Uh, this is Kevin. I'll be your moderator for the Q&A. Uh, with me on the panel, I have uh, Mr. Danny Ong, Dr. Go, uh, Dr. Thornback, Dr. Cho, and with me on the call, I have Dr. Yong, Dr. Fong, and also Prof. Slack. Yeah. So uh, I'll be moderating some of the Q&A that has been uh, posted right here on the um, Q&A chat. So I think the most uh, voted for question uh, is, the, is that the recently circular uh, recently, circular RNA is gaining traction in research. So, do you also see this in liquid biopsy? And is there any connection to microRNA? So, maybe I can post this to um, Dr. Cho, Dr. Frank, and also uh, Dr. Thornback. Yeah. So, Dr. Cho first, maybe go ahead. I think Frank is probably the best to, to start that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Prof. Slack. Frank, we can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Yeah, maybe we move on to the next question first while, while we sort out some of the technical issues. Yeah, so the next one is, um, how sensitive is PCR-based assay in detecting single nucleotide change in uh, miRNA? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Cho? Sure, uh, I'll take that. Um, I think for microRNA or any, any nuclear assay, there's always uh, different methods. Um, so, namely, sequencing microarray and uh, PCR. And I wouldn't say, you know, any one particular method is better than the other. It really depends on the context of application. Uh, the reason why PCR, when we look at the clinical application of microRNA, it has been uh, almost 100% using PCR uh, because these uh, microRNAs are extremely small. So to optimize an NGS or microarray-based microRNA test has been extremely difficult. And uh, also the affordability of running those for a small panel of microRNAs are, are probably not as uh, economical as PCR. So when it comes down to uh, single nucleotide uh, differences or differentiation of those uh, homologous family members, uh, it is one of the key analytical validation step when we launch any microRNA test. So in the 12 microRNA uh, gastroclear, uh, beyond you know, the clinical validation, we actually conducted extensive validation of its closest family member. And generally speaking, we are able to achieve at least a 50-fold differentiation of uh, single nu nucleotide differences. Um, but again, we have to put that in the context of the clinical problem. So if we have two very similar microRNA, 
uh, which differ by 1,004 in the clinical sample, then a 54 analytical specificity is insufficient. But fortunately, when we look at many of the circulating microRNAs, uh, the biological differences is less than that, which means a 54 analytical specificity is more than sufficient, at least for all the disease we have seen so far. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhou. All right, uh, I think we are back online with Prof uh, Slack. So uh, maybe you'd like to go back to the first question. Uh, Prof Slack, uh, I'll repeat it uh, once more. So recently, circular RNA is gaining traction in research. Do you also see these in liquid biopsy? And is there any connection to microRNA? Prof Slack, please. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, OK, great. Sorry about that. I had to restart the, the webinar. Um, yes, so, so your, uh, as, as I was saying earlier, your, um, the people asking the questions are clearly following the latest trends in RNA research, and um, circular RNAs are indeed emerging as uh, important players in, in the RNA networks within cells. Um, so circular RNAs are the result of, uh, of a backsplicing event be between sort of uh, introns and exons, and um, can be detected by um, a number of different approaches, including like uh, a PCR-based approach, which amplifies across the junction that would be formed in the circle. Uh, they are very new, and so the work on them as biomarkers is just beginning. I think I mentioned in my talk that there were over 900 clinical trials with microRNAs, but there are only two at the moment with circular RNAs. Uh, but as I've spoken to, to Lee Han and the Merix's team about in the past, I, I think that this is going to be a useful area uh, for them to try and develop uh, tests around, especially for brain disease. I mean, these circular RNAs are found very extensively in the brain. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Slack. Right, uh, next, we have a question for Dr. Go. Right, so uh, how do clinical labs minimize pre-analytical variations and what is the minimum number of samples recommended for validation? Dr. Gopi. Okay, on the first question first, um, what we, uh, we did is to get the phlebotomies to indicate the time of blood draw on the blood tubes so that when they are sent to the laboratory, we ensure that it's processed within the required time frame. In this case, it's within two hours. Right, and after the spin, we will also check for hemolysis I think Lee Han showed uh, a color chart earlier. So if it's like quite orangey and you know quite red, then that will indicate um, hemolysis and the sample will be rejected. On your second question, the, the standard doesn't specify exactly how many samples um, are needed for validation. So I think it depends on the complexity of the assay as well as the, or the number of uh, analytes to be analyzed. Um, in this case, because it's new, so we decided to validate 50 as a minimum uh, specimen requirement. Uh, most of the time, our minimum requirement is 20 samples. But in this case, um, we validated more. Thank you, Dr. Go. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, next, we have a question specifically for Dr. Yong. So uh, you mentioned that there was new ground broken with the creation of SS656. So with regards to standards and its roles in innovation, uh, is it always a positive impact or would there be instances where there have been adverse and inverse impacts? Uh, Dr. Yong, please. Okay, so that's a, I would say it's a good question. And answer is a key So what, what I mean is, look at standards, the for example, you have you have uh, manufacturing standards, which is to do design and development purpose. And also, I think recently, a lot of it is related to operating standards or adopting. So, in our experience, uh, especially at scheme, we actually have seen spectrum standards created from different stages of maturity. Or the operating model of design. So, uh, to me, in terms of if you're asking what helps, especially from a new process perspective, it's always the more on the passion of operating. Right? So let's say in a very certain way to do with going to the quality. So 
generally positive because I think standards help to actually introduce the the, the area in wider country. But at the same time, I would say you have to time when it is standard because early you might exclude uh, you know, some other voters to solve the problem. Not relating, let's say, case, but more of, let's say, the remodel process. So that is the time coming from experience where I said it effective uh, in development of standards in the kind of innovation uh, research and development. Right. Thank you, Dr. Yong. Uh, next, we have a regulatory um, related question for Mr. Jenny Ong. So, uh, you mentioned about product registration. So, if my RNA assay lab is a lab developed test, do we also need to submit it for product registration? Uh, okay. So, the, the lab developed tests, um, by definition, they are, they are uh, diagnostic assays that uh, developed within a lab, uh, manufactured within a lab, and then um, for use only within that particular lab. So um, we have scoped the, the, the SS656 um, standard to include both um, in vitro diagnostics, um, medical devices, as well as um, uh, lab developed tests uh, or LDTs. Um, but in terms of product registration, the LDTs are actually exempted from, from product registration, but they are more uh, managed under the PHMC lab license requirement. Yeah, so actually product registration is not required for um, lab developed tests. Uh, thank you, Mr. Danny Ong. Right. Um, next, I'd like to just put a question on the floor for anyone uh, that wants to answer. So, do you see the need to develop miRNA diagnostic to replace the current tumor markers such as CA125? If yes, what is the gap to fill now to move that forward? Yeah. I, I think that I mean, things like CA125 and um, actually, funnily enough, many, many years ago, I was one of the team that helped to develop the CA125 years and years ago. Um, that They are very old markers and they're very non-specific markers. I think we've moved, <coughs> made a lot of uh, the, our knowledge of how, of tumor biology, our knowledge of what we're trying to, uh, the patient populations and um, how um, diagnostics are used has changed dramatically. We saw in the, on the slides I put up that um, there are comp you can, they can be pro predictive, pro prognostic or diagnostic um, tests. And I think that what we're seeing with the microRNA um, based diagnostics is we have a much wider possibility for um, developing uh, specific tests. Um, which is it's specific targeted populations for specific um, indications for use, which I think that you don't see with simple um, protein biomarkers. All right. Thank you, Dr. Tombeck. Uh, Dr. Zhou would like to add on something as well. Yeah. Uh, if I may add on, uh, as much as you know, um, we are microRNA centric. Um, I think the future of medicine is, um, you know, multi analyte uh, tests. Uh, I would say protein test has been mostly, most widely implemented. Uh, even today, probably 90% of the routine clinical tests are done on proteins. Right? So I will, I will still advocate that there are um, a value to protein tests, but as John has mentioned, there are lim limitations. So to me, you know, uh, I believe in the future, we, the physician will look at a combined report of DNA, uh, mRNA, microRNA, and proteins. And depending on the disease application, maybe one of the classes will outweigh the other. But so what we are advocating as a, as, a, as a developer is always a plus approach instead of replacing. I think in the clinical world, if we can manage the workflow to provide the best information to the clinicians at the most affordable price, you know, combining multi-analyte is actually uh, worth exploring. And of course, we see distinct advantage of each of the class of biomarkers. And particularly in the case of CA125, uh, there is an ongoing project we have uh, with uh, uh, NUH, DTSH, and DXD, uh, specifically to look at the combinatorial power of microRNA plus CA125, which really give us uh, one plus one more than two effect. So uh, my, 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 my take is um, um, uh, we try to combine 
uh, to give uh, more clinical utility, but the process and the cost must be managed. Thank you, Dr. Cho, and also Dr. Thornback. Uh, so to tag on to your point on looking towards the future, I have one for Prof Slack. So how do you see microRNA diagnostics impacting personalized medicine? Dr. Uh, Prof Slack, please. Uh, yes, this is clearly, uh, just, to, just to add on to what Dr. Zhao was saying uh, earlier about how medicine is sort of moving to multi-analyte um, uh, tests and, and how a physician is going to be looking at both genomics and transcriptomics and proteomics in order to make their decisions. Um, we, we see microRNAs as sort of one tool in that um, ongoing sort of march towards personalized medicine. Um, you know, we, we've looked at um, the prospect of combining genome sequencing with microRNA detection as a, as a potential uh, uh, better um, way to, to sort of decide which patients are going to respond to certain therapies. I mean, that's, that's the sort of ultimate goal of precision medicine, that, that, that we'll be able to tell physicians exactly which drugs um, each patient is going to best respond to. And one thing that I, that I would just point out is that you know, we've talked a lot about RNA today as being a diagnostic marker, but in fact, one of the arms of precision uh, of, sort of RNA medicine is, is, in fact, being able to either deliver RNA as a drug or target RNA as a drug. Uh, you already know about some of the drugs that are approved, like uh, siRNA drugs, these RNAi drugs that will target a messenger RNA um, as, a, as a therapeutic option in certain disease. And we also have examples of delivering RNA, um, an example that's, that's quite uh, you know, popular right now is to try and to, uh, devise RNA-based vaccines against, for example, SARS-CoV-2. So at some point, we're going to be able to combine the, the genomics, the transcriptomics, to not only decide what uh, current therapies might be available to patients, but also maybe try and design an RNA-based therapy that would be appropriate for that patient as well. Thanks. Right. Uh, thank you, Prof. Slack. So uh, on synergies, I have a question here for um, Dr. Fong. So Dr. Fong, um, what are the pros and cons for miRNA as a biomarker compared to, let's say, maybe DNA and protein? And also, are there any synergies between the different types of biomarkers? Uh, Dr. Fong, please. Uh, yes, the microRNA, can you hear me? Um, it has an advantage yeah. of being small and overall much better specific profile. I think that's one of the major uh, And also it's created in many more numbers and then twice another advantage. The, I think the challenges uh, we have a speak on um, Professor Slack uh, as uh, indicated that small very small size microRNA of the patient and accurate to the data that make And in terms of combination, um, they have already uh, mentioned as well the professor's fact. I think in the future, multi variant, potential multi uh, market type is set. Uh, we are just provide much of the that especially for any uh, heterogeneous diseases. I'm sorry, I'm hearing a lot of echoes, so that's that's been uh, difficult for me to speak. Did I answer the question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Fong. All right, so um, I have one specifically for Dr. Cho. Uh, we know that um, you mentioned that you have learned a lot of lessons uh, throughout your whole, whole journey uh, developing GastroClear. And SS656 is sort of a um, summary of, of your lessons learned and also um, helping people uh, overcome such difficulties that you have come across, the challenges and difficulties. So um, what are the key lessons learned from developing and deploying GastroClear? Right. Um 
Yeah, so to, to take it short, I mean, Gashu Clear took us um, six years from doing the first experiment on the bench to getting the dossier ready to submit to HSA Danny's team. Um, I think it could have been done a lot faster, but um, uh, as we mentioned, the pre-analytics uh, part was, um, was something we didn't know. So we got into discovery and uh, as Danny's uh, uh, last slide has shown, we basically went into product development without resolving some of the pre-analytical steps, which, which essentially means, you know, we had to re-kickstart the whole process. So that took a lot of iterations. And, um, you know, I, I think that can be avoided uh, from the moment that clinical enrollment start to either get the patient samples, biomarker discovery or validation. Uh, that's extremely important, as Danny has said. Uh, if we didn't start with any in mind, and if we didn't know all the processes in between, chances are we're going to fail at one of the steps. And for medical device, there's re really no room for failure, right? So, so I think pre-analytical, um, and during the analytical steps, uh, as Ling has um, uh, mentioned, there are four key steps within the lab itself, right? How do we design a product which can be widely applied, not only in the research lab where it is discovered, where you know the lab had the, the skill sets, the knowledge, and probably the equipment, which many of the clinical lab uh, probably do not have. So again, the usability of the device is also something that I think all developers need to think about in order for wide clinical adoption. And the third thing is really, how do we then you know present the data to a busy clinician who doesn't have all the time to read microRNA papers or, or, or to look at you know, what's the latest in circular RNA or any other uh, research setting, right? So the interpretation of that medical device and the actionability of the medical device is also something extremely key. Otherwise, we are developing a research tool that will remain on the bench and never reach the bedside. So I think the core lesson learned in uh, Gastro Clear is really making sure that we have the end in mind. We have probably think through all the processes with the goal of engaging the clinician to implement the test. So uh, that's some of the things that uh, we recommended to SS656. Yeah. Um, in my experience, it's, um, I'd agree with what, uh, what uh, Dr. Zhu said, um, but in addition to talking to the clinicians, you have to actually be involved in what the laboratory does as well. Um, one of the in other companies which I've, I've run, one of the big issues has been Although the, although the clinicians might want to order the test, the lab will go. Well, actually, we don't have the we don't have the technicians trained. We, it's not enough tests to, for us to bother to do that, or we don't have the right equipment, or you know we just don't get those requests at the moment. So we're not going to we're not going to set up we're not going to run the test. So you have to think when you're developing a product, not only the clinical need but actually the laboratory need the, the laboratory. So you have to involve both the laboratory specialists and, and the clinicians. The clinicians are a pull, but also you, you have to really get, get the laboratory um, um, scientists on board as well. Otherwise, you just get blocked. You, you, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, actually, you know, we just don't have time. We're, 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 laboratories um, you know, are always understaffed and overstretched, <laughs> um, clinical laboratories. So you've got to try and make it as easy as possible for them to make that decision to offer that test. And I think that's a very big lesson learned. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhou and Dr. Uh, Tom Beck. So I think to, to tag on uh, on the lessons learned from um, 656, uh, sorry, uh, on the lessons learned from, from the development of GastroClear, um, how would SS656 then help to standardize and accelerate uh, implementation of uh, miRNA diagnostic test? Right, uh, it, maybe I can start here. I, I think SS656, uh, I'm hoping that uh, it will be read not only, not only by the, uh, the industry groups or the clinical labs or, or, or the regulators, but in fact, uh, I think you know, some of the thinking process behind it um, uh, um, should be available, made available to, to any translational researchers who are hoping to bring a new discovery for research to a potential uh, uh, bedside application. Right, so that includes uh, many of the pre-analytical and the clinical utility thinking. And um, what Yulian has shown, you know, we typically have tens of thousands of biomarker publications, and only you know 0.1% of those turns into 
uh, a clinical product. And the reason is not because the, the research labs are not doing their job, but they were not informed of the many aspects that, that I think you know, we have talked in, in all these presentations to bring something into the clinical setting, right? So I'm very much hoping that ASIC 6156 is not just an industry standard, but something that will guide people to think about microRNA or any RNA test development. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhou. So uh, I'd like to put one on the floor for, for anyone to answer. So what are the steps considered to improve sensitivity and specificity before deeming the miRNA is not suitable as a biomarker and move on to the next target? So maybe this one is more for, for, for Dr. Tom Beck, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, when you're doing the biomarker discovery, um, I should have brought the team along tonight. <laughs> that's this question for me. Dominic, where are you? Because um, we talked about this the other day, actually. And um, I think, you know, what, what you're looking for is um, when you're looking at biomarker discovery, one of the things you have to really have is very well um, curated clinical samples. That's the big thing. So you've got to have, if you're looking um, to differentiate between a um, patient population and a normal population, you have to you have to be very sure that you have those those patient samples very well curated, and that's the essence of it in general, because that allows you then to do to pick the to identify the, the different the differentiation between the um, clinical situation and the normal so-called normal patients and if you don't have that then you'll never see the differences which is especially in something like um, the microRNA where you've got a multi uh, the, it's going to be a multi analyte it's not going to be you're not going to pick up one and pretty well never going to pick up one biomar one microRNA that's going to be specific it's going to be a mixture like gastroclase 12 and then you're having an algorithm to do a risk analysis so it's all about having well curated um, samples, clinical samples that be in all parts of your process that allows you to differentiate. To do that. That's the key. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tom Beck. Uh, we have one here specifically for PROSLAC. So uh, Dr. Yong mentioned that uh, variability between findings of research groups is known. And in the development of the standard by um, the XD Hub, could you summarize the steps taken to validate the accuracy of the standard? Uh, I'm not too sure if I'm the best person to answer that. Um, probably Dr. Zhao is better sort of to answer that because we, we haven't as yet uh, tried to validate this particular standard. I can tell you though that, that, that we use the Merxus technology in our lab and uh, we use the protocols, um, but, but you know, we, we've basically followed the protocols as opposed to sort of try to, you know, improve upon them or validate them at this point. Thank you, Prof. Slack. So uh, I'll just um, round this up with maybe uh, the last few questions. So uh, since the future of diagnostics are multi-omics, how should we prepare ourselves from data overload and where we draw the line to say the product is now good enough to push for commercialization? Uh, maybe Dr. Thornbeck or, or Dr. Yeah. So. Well, the key question is what's going to be the clinical utility? That's always got to be your question. You know, um, the doctor doesn't care what the technology is. They care about the result. So you're, if, you, if, if you're not bringing uh, more information that allows the clinician to make a better <laughs> clinical judgment on how to treat that patient, then you don't have a diagnostic. That's the bottom line. Right, so you work until it's all. You've always got to be focused on the clinical utility. That's the message. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tom Beck. So uh, I think we'll have our last question here. So uh, this is for Prof Slack again, and also looking into the future again. Uh, what is the next frontier of microRNA research and clinical translation? Wow, um, I I feel personally that it's going to be a combination of microRNA diagnostics and microRNA therapeutics. So in some cases, there are sort of well-documented examples, like the example that, that was mentioned earlier about MIR-21, that, that looks like it's upregulated in, in many different cancer types, and uh, it's clearly an oncogene in many different cancer types. 
And uh, so you can imagine a diagnostic to examine the levels of MIR-21 followed by a, a therapeutic that targets MIR-21 um, to, to sort of knock down the levels. So you have sort of a theranostic approach here where, where the RNA is both the companion diagnostic and the therapeutic target. Um, but, you know, that that is, you know, I mean, while there are clinical trials already targeting microRNAs in a variety of cancers, um, it's it, it's not in widespread um, application right now. So this is something sort of in the in the future. Um, I think uh, another point that was brought up is, is is this idea of using microRNAs to understand the the actual disease. So so not only knowing which microRNAs get secreted into the bloodstream, but also looking at the tissues themselves and asking, you know, what are the what are the misregulated RNAs? Because as as was shown, that can help you build pathways and, and so help you understand the disease and identify nodes that that, that that might be targetable in that particular disease. Um, so I think there's I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a, there's a lot of wide open questions. Um, certainly, you know, there there's a there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I mean, you know, John mentioned that there were 600 microRNAs that were easily detectable in, in, in human serum, but there are about 2,500 of them uh, that are made in our, in our, in our cells. And uh, there are probably 2, 250,000 variants of those microRNAs. So really just trying to understand what these, what these RNAs are doing and how they're, how they're impacting uh, cellular processes and, and health is gonna keep us busy for, for a very long time. So uh, unfortunately, we run out of time for, for our Q&A. Uh, sorry, we cannot answer all of the questions. So uh, here, I'd like to thank uh, my presenters and also, also panelists for joining us today. And also uh, everyone who's uh, viewing this online. Uh, thank you for joining us, taking time out to join us and uh, have a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.